Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the MEI ISAS panel discussion titled Beyond the Checkpoints, New Geopolitics of Arabian Seaports. This webinar is a collaboration between the Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS, and the Middle East Institute, NUS. I am Ramita Ayer, a research analyst at ISAS. Before we proceed with the event, I would appreciate if the participants could mute their microphones when other speakers are in conversation. Today, we are delighted to have with us three distinguished panelists. Dr. Hafiz Jamali, Additional Secretary, Government of Balochistan, Pakistan. Today, he will be speaking in his capacity as an academic and not on behalf of the government. We also have with us Dr. Yusuf al Bulushi, EPCM Operations Interfaces Head, Petrofac Oman, and Dr. Mohsin Soldus, the University of Queensland, Brisbane, Australia. The session will be chaired by Dr. Amin Lutfi, Research Fellow, Middle East Institute, NUS. I now invite Dr. Amit Ranjan, Research Fellow at ISAS, to deliver his welcome remarks. Dr. Uh, Ranjan, please. Uh, thanks, Ramita, for introducing the panelists. On behalf of ISAS and MEI, I welcome the panelists and other participants in this panel discussion on Beyond the Choke Points, New Geopolitics of Arabian Seaports. The state of Hormuz is an important route to carry trade from the Middle East to different parts of the world. In 2018, Saudi Arabia shipped nearly 6.4 million barrels of oil per day via the strait, while Iraq sent more than 3.7 million, the UAE about 2.7 million, and Kuwait over 2 million. Any minor disturbance or political turmoil in the region can affect such supply, primarily to protect its strategic and all interest and of its allies, the US's fifth fleet is based in Bahrain. In recent years to avoid high dependence on the old ports in the Middle East through a sizable foreign investments, infrastructures have been built in Oman, Pakistan, and Iran. Modern ports at Dukam, Gwadar, and Chabahar are likely to move the global and regional politics beyond the choke points in the region. This panel discussion will explore the broader implications of this possible shift and address many relevant questions on choke points and new ports. I look forward to get enlightened about the region and about the choke points from this panel discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Amit, for the opening comments. Now, without wasting time, I think we would proceed to our speakers. Each speaker would have about 15 minutes to speak. And at the end of the, when, when each of the three have spoken, we'll have, I'll say um, a few remarks and then we'll open up to the floor to question and answers. Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Hafiz Jamali, uh, who in addition to, who's, who's, who's an anthropologist uh, uh, right now uh, working with this, very closely related to the CPEC projects. Uh, Dr. Hafiz Jamali, if you could unmute yourself. Sorry, you're still muted. Um, uh, thank you so much, Amim, and you know uh, my uh, colleagues at um, uh, the Middle East Institute and South Asia Institute at NUS for giving me this opportunity to be part of this um, very uh, um, important uh, conversation. Um, um, as Amim, uh, as our um, uh, introducer, uh, moderator said at the beginning, um, I'll be speaking in my capacity as an expert, but as the proverbial, uh, you know, uh, saying goes, you can uh, take a person out of the bureaucracy, but you cannot take the bureaucracy out of it. So uh, part of it, you know, it's a part of the sort of the slides that I'm going to show and you know, things I'm going to talk to you about, you know, may appear a bit bureaucratic to you. Um, uh, so uh, let me begin by uh, sort of uh, offering some pre uh, preliminary remarks, and I'm I'm going to share my sort of uh, couple slides here just by way of uh, you know um, orientation, um, not meant to. Um, and okay, is this one? This one? Okay. Uh, let me make sure that I got it um, right. Yes, yes, we can see it. Is it visible on me? Yes, yes, it is. 
So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I first, first of all, I must sort of, uh, you know, uh, beg the pardon of my colleagues that I'm not a security analyst primarily, I'm an anthropologist, uh, you know, um, an anthropologist of infrastructure, you know. Uh, so um, I, I am relatively new to this discussion of choke points and you know the lack of the choke points. So you know I'll I'll speak a bit to it, but also sort of the to the more anthropological side of things. So Gawadar, uh, well before uh, the start of the ambitious uh, China Pakistan corridor and infrastructural developments, um, uh, you know Gawadar was an important node, uh, you know, in the maritime. Uh, commercial circuits of the Indian Ocean under both Portuguese and Omani, uh, you know, um, uh, rule. Uh, here's a map. You can see Gwadar, uh, you know, right close to the um, um, on the coast, close to the um, uh, Iran and Pakistan border. And here is an overview from the Mount Batel of the Gwadar town, and you know, it's you know, you can see it's in semicircular base, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, so, well, before the start of, the, of this new geopolitical uh, rivalry of, you know, port building in the Indian Ocean, Gawadar was an important uh, harbor town, uh, which was under Omani rule for uh, well over 200 years before it was eventually uh, uh, returned to Pakistan through a mutual uh, treaty of friendship between the two other countries of Pakistan and Oman. Um, since uh, at least um, the 2000s, Gawadar has been a linchpin of Pakistan's uh, strategy to project its economic and um, uh, commercial power into the Arabian uh, Sea and the Indian Ocean. Uh, the port and its allied infrastructure were built uh, at a cost of $248 million uh, with Chinese assistance, of course. The port operations were initially uh, awarded through a competitive bidding process to the, um, you know, uh, the Port Authority of Singapore, but uh, they weren't uh, able to operate it profitably. So it was handed over to the China Overseas Port Holding Corporation in 2013, and they have been, uh, you know, uh, managing the operations of the port. Although the port itself is, uh, you know, is uh, an asset of um, the other Port Authority, the GPA, which is an attached department of uh, the Maritime Affairs Ministry of Pakistan. Uh, Gawadar received a significant boost from the inauguration or start of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor uh, because it is the terminus, terminus for a number of, uh, you know, uh, trade routes, uh, you know, converging on Gawadar. Um, it is still undergoing expansion. Um, uh, you know, there is, uh, Another sort of $1.6 billion are um, expected to be spent on building additional terminals. Um, currently, it is capable of um, admitting uh, ships of approximately 50,000 uh, deadweight ton. But, uh, you know, uh, over time, it is expected that it will be able to uh, handle other ships, you know, of 70 to 100,000 uh, deadweight tons. And here's a glimpse of the activities at the port. That's the Chinese liner Costco docking at Gawadar with container cargo. Uh, here's another cargo of urea that was unloaded earlier at the port. So, you know, port is operational and it is in, you know, uh, the traffic is at the moment is, uh, is limited, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, well on its way. And just to sort of give the broader sort of context to this issue, it is, of course, we all, most of you have, must have seen this map. Is the uh, ambitious BRI program of government of China, um, you know, which uh, and CPEC, uh, you know, uh, you can see, you know, it's in the almost in the middle of the map. You can see CPEC, and you can see the terminus uh, of CPEC at Gomal. So that's sort of you know the the way it is uh, you know configured. So of course there is a maritime uh, dimension to Gomal as a port in the in the broader sort of Indian Ocean. Uh, strategy of Pakistan, China, and other, uh, you know, um, countries uh, uh, on the Indian Ocean Rim. But we should bear in mind that it is, um, actually, it is a terminus of a land bridge. You know, CPEC can be conceived as a land bridge between China and Pakistan, which basically sort of, you know, goes over the Karakuram uh, Himalaya mountains, you know, in the north. 
And another sort of misconception about Gawadar that, you know, is even uh, I felt was implied, uh, was sort of evident from the questions that were uh, put forward for discussion is that somehow it is exclusively a Chinese board, you know, or uh, there's also been a lot of talk that I've seen in security circles, uh, you know, that it is somehow, you know, it's a way of China projecting its uh, influence in, into the uh, Persian Gulf or uh, you know, the Arabian Sea region. Uh, well, our countries influence things, but the, the nature of influence is always different uh, from case to case. In the case of Gawadar, it is conceived primarily and solely, I would say, as a, uh, as a commercial port. Its operations are commercially uh, you know, based and uh, Gawadar does not actually have any military or strategic military dimension to it. Um, and the reason is simple. Pakistan has a na naval base, uh, the Jinnah naval base, which is about 200 kilometers from 200, 250 kilometers from Gawadar at Ormara. So they all, Pakistan already has a fully fledged, uh, a very strong uh, naval base uh, on the Makan coast. And that's why, you know, sort of uh, Gawadar uh, uh, port's primary purpose is not military, it's, it's commercial and economic. And CPEC itself uh, has been sort of described uh, erroneously many times as a, uh, uh, you know, uh, as having a strategic or military dimension. Uh, it has an economic dimension and economic uh, strategic dimension, but it's a broad sort of a deep and very broad, uh, you know, kind of cooperation, umbrella cooperation. And Gawadar Port forms one part of it, an important part, but only one part of it. Uh, which is primarily has to do with this role as a trade trans and transshipment hub, you know, and you can see that, you know, yellow thing, you know, yellow box there, which mentions it. Uh, other components of CPEC, energy, infrastructure, uh, industrial cooperation, you know, you can, you can see them there. So it's a very broad, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of initiative, you know, CPEC between China and Pakistan, which has, uh, which, uh, whose primary dimensions are economic and um, not military at all. Um, that's why it's called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So you can see, for example, uh, out of the total uh, uh, committed amount of uh, uh, US dollar 50 billion, almost $35 billion uh, projects are devoted to energy sector. Uh, you see the orange sort of line there. Um, uh, and then, you know, another uh, uh, 10 to 15 billion uh, dollars are devoted to, uh, uh, you know, road and rail connectivity, you know, um, within Pakistan and between Pakistan and China. And then obviously there are SEZs being built, there's Gawadar Free Zone itself, then we have the uh, SEZ in near Karachi, the Dhabeji, and then we have near Quetta, the Bostan SEZ. So, so the, the broader uh, and this is sort of an official map of, you know, the, the spatial planning of CPEC, you know, uh, and you can see that, you know, Pakistan under the CPEC has been divided into various, uh, you know, uh, economic zones, and Gawadar sits at two of these uh, economic zones. So, so the broader sort of uh, idea behind CPEC is to leverage uh, Connectivity, infrastructure, and connectivity through building ports and roads. You can see in the map there are three different axes of CPEC. Uh, there is the uh, eastern alignment through Multan and Lahore. There is the uh, central alignment, uh, you, you know, through DI, uh, DG Khan, and then uh, DI Khan, and then there is the western alignment, you know, uh, through Quetta. You know, uh, you know that all and all of them converged all of these three uh, alignments of CPEC, they are highways and uh, railroads going to be built, being built around them, will converge at Gawadar Port. So, uh, so the idea is to leverage infrastructure development, uh, availability of large supplies of energy, cheap energy for industrial development and industrial production, you know, uh, in Pakistan, because China intends to shift uh, a significant portion of its uh, industrial capacity to Pakistan, you know, uh, you know, as part of its ongoing, uh, you know, uh, diversification strategy. 
So the primary idea is to uh, leverage uh, industrial geographical connectivity for industrial and economic development. That's the heart of CETA. And here are some glimpses of the projects. Uh, these are the pro projects in Gowada. You can see the new state of the art uh, business and uh, uh, trade center. Um, the port, uh, the expressway being built, there is a modern airport, uh, you know, which will be capable of holding large, uh, hosting large aircraft that is uh, being built around Gawadar. And here's sort of a map of that connectivity that I was talking about, you know. Uh, so you can see it's part, and uh, CPAC itself is a part of the broader strategy of Pakistan for regional connectivity. So if you look, so there are, you know, there are pointers to uh, our neighbor India, you know, for sort of through the Kokrapar Munabao route, there, there is a, a planned rail link to uh, uh, you know, strengthening the existing rail link with Iran and Turkey to promote trade there, and, and of course to uh, Afghanistan and Jalalabad, you know, uh, you know, to promote trade with uh, Iran, uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia. So, so, so it's, uh, and this is a glimpse of you know, the um, uh, sort of many, uh, you know, energy projects that have been undertaken under CPEC. And you can see it's a broad mix of power projects. There is coal, there is solar, there is wind, there is hydro power, you know, which is, uh, you know, being done. And again, sort of, you know, it's uh, the level of cooperation goes beyond CPEC itself. You know, this is an image of the China, Pakistan, uh, Iran, uh, Pakistan pipeline, which unfortunately sort of uh, has slowed down a little bit because of the invocation of sanctions and the harsh rhetoric employed by the Trump administration. Um, and this, all of this has brought, you know, uh, uh, obviously it has led to some conflict, uh, you know, in the region and there have been attacks on security forces, Pakistani security forces uh, by, uh, you know, uh, ethno-nationalist uh, militants in Balochistan and uh, to counter those, there has been a, 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 a heavy security deployment uh, in and around Gawadar to protect you know, this economic asset uh, by Pakistani authorities. And this is a, you know, another picture, again, a picture of a recent attack in Gawadar that took place in Gawadar and you know, two of our, uh, two of the security guards at the uh, local hotel, the Per Continent Hotel were martyred in that uh, attack. So you know, so so it, there is there is an element of sort of you know there uh, of uh, certain ethno-nationalist Baloch ethno-nationalist groups trying to sort of you know who are opposed to CPAC and you know uh, they have been sort of targeting security forces in and around Gowada for uh, for some time. Um, um, I don't know, you know, that was a basic introduction. Maybe I can sort of speak to these issues later, but I want to flag them that you know as. So first of all, I think uh, if I go to the um, to the uh, idea of uh, connectivity, um, I want to um, emphasize that uh, when uh, in the talk here, in the questions that were put forward, it was implied that it will take uh, you know how it will affect the choke points in the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. My sort of broader concern is. That when we speak of globalization or uh, uh, connectivity, there has to be greater cooperation and trade uh, and understanding among various uh, countries uh, and nations in the region itself. You know, for these newer initiatives, for the, uh, these newer ports to uh, uh, prosper. So, for instance, within South Asia, because of various sort of conflicts between India and Pakistan and you know Sri Lanka and other, uh, you know, Bangladesh, etc. Their uh, volume of regional trade within South Asian countries is not that great. Um, if you look at uh, the Persian Gulf region, again, the uh, because of you know historic rivalry between Iran and some of the uh, Arab uh, Gulf Arab countries, the volume of uh, intra-regional trade is actually, and you know the extent of intra-regional is actually not that great. You know, so. So my sort of concern uh, is that, you know, for these ports to prosper, you know, this to moving away from the chokehold of, you know, as you have spoken of the uh, Hormuz, state of Hormuz, there has to be some kind of a turnaround in terms of the, uh, the relations and the nature of, you know, increased trade between, you know, for example, Oman and Pakistan, between UAE and uh, Iran, between you know sort of these countries you know it cannot be that these countries each sort of are standing on their little port you know 
and you know thinking that they will be able to attract you know commercial uh, you know traffic to the, that port while you know the rest of the region is somehow not as integrated or as you know uh, uh, well connected so that's sort of my broader argument and then if there is time later i will come back to you know some of the local issues uh, that you know are specific to gwadar as a result of this kind of infrastructure mm -hmm. development you know but I think I'm running out of my time, so I don't want to take up my colleague's time. Maybe we can take these issues, you know, um, in, in the later part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hafiz, for really setting up the talk and reminding us about um, how, like, no port is can sustain by itself, and it only works if it is in relationship with other ports. So with that, we go into a port close by. Uh, to Dr. Yusuf Belushi, who is going to be talking about the Dukum port. Dr. Belushi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Neem. Uh, thank you, NUS and Middle East Institute uh, for this organization, organizing of this talk. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, Following to my uh, colleague speaker, Dr. Hafiz, uh, I'll be focusing into Dukum. And uh, my, this, my, uh, I mean, uh, my topic, I mean, I, I divided it to talk about three main uh, points, which is first of all, the, the context or the main context of the economic and political position in Oman after the change of the, the leadership, which happened last year. And then I'll go in deep to discuss, I mean, about Dukum port and Dukum around projects and how that, uh, uh, how that is reaching and developing. And then we'll go to the, I mean, the regional political situation at the moment after, I mean, with, with all, all changes that happen. So, uh, I mean, as everyone uh, assume aware, I mean, the early 2020, there's a big change happened in the country by the change of the leadership, uh, a long-standing leadership, H.M. Uh, Qabus bin Saeed, and he was succeeded by H.M. Haytham. And I'm bringing that to the table because the, the main philosophy and the approach of the leadership, uh, I think it's, uh, it's moved and deviated a bit from being political-centered to be economical-centered. And that, that's, that's, we can look into it from two different points of view. Either it is the gradual development, the normal development that we have. Uh, I mean, the country realized that they have to start, I mean, cutting the fruits of all political situation, uh, I mean, positions they were in earlier and try to facilitate that economically. And as well from the other side, due to the, to the uh, heavy economic, I mean, tough situation we are facing in Oman due to the uh, big uh, debt, which is, I mean, as, as, uh, as stated uh, recently about 20 billion, 20 billion OMR, which is around $46 billion maybe. And uh, with, uh, with a very scattered, flatted uh, organization, which was in the government. Uh, so, I mean, that brought a big challenge to the new leadership to look into how to optimize uh, the country's economies and to look into the financial situation because it's really, really, uh, it was warning the, I mean, uh, the red light. So, uh, I mean, starting from there, uh, I mean, HM moved to look for, I mean, or the leadership moved to look into what are the opportunities available. I mean, the debt, as I mentioned, it is top the roof. There is no, no, any, I mean, uh, more room to go there. That's immediately took the political position to be really vital to look a solution to be politically to come away from uh, the economic situation. And I think as well, as I said, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the new leadership, it's not, I mean, they, their approach is not centered uh, politically. So therefore we can see immediately 
start, uh, I mean, harmony within the GCC, and I'm talking from from Oman uh, side to them. So there's uh, there's a discussion uh, started from last year, close discussion with UAE, close discussion with Saudi, where we we were not finding the same in the last in the recent five or uh, seven years from the, the the earlier leadership's time. Uh, and I think that because maybe there's, there were a uh, different point of view happened, especially after Arab Spring. Therefore, the, the earlier leadership, I mean, uh, took a side uh, from being involved and engaged. But current leadership, we can see that's totally different. There is an engagement happening. And, uh, and that's starting even though to help and support as usual into resolving some of the, I mean, uh, political tensions in the in the region, and mainly Oman's involvement in Yemen's resolution, and we can see, I mean, especially, I mean, these weeks, the last couple of weeks, a lot of, uh, I mean, discussions happening, flights and uh, and high officials from Oman, they were in Yemen two three days back. And even those, how Saudis is supporting Oman's movement toward being Masqat, uh, I mean, the host of that solution, uh, which we were not finding this language from different parties, especially, I mean, from Saudi and UAE, from the other party uh, in the past three, four years. So there is a really, there is a movement toward a harmony and a closure relation where when you will think about it, yeah, Oman will support them politically, but the only outcome which Oman can get out of that, it is the support toward their economic situation. I mean, going from there as well, I mean, the, uh, I mean 2021, uh, it is the first year of implementing the big vision of Oman, which is Oman 2040, which was headed in the drafting stage by H.M. Haytham himself. And uh, when that happened immediately, there's a big, uh, big uh, thought and a big belief that uh, the new leadership, since they designed and planned this vision, they will drive it through. But with the current, uh, I mean, COVID situation or the health situation across, across the globe, and as well, as I say, the economic situation, it seems that vision in the first now six months, it's not uh, taking off from the ground so far. It needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of I mean, reorganizing within the system itself. We can see last year there were a shuffle and restructuring of the ministries and the cabinet. Still, I mean, I think the resourcing part of the re restructuring happened. Now the legislative part of that restructuring, which will align with the restructuring of the resources, is really vital to take off this vision to the second level. Still, that's not there due to the, to a lot of social and internal. I mean, social issue, which is really uh, evolving the country into internal uh, political uh, I mean, disturbance a bit. But when, I'm, when I mentioned now Oman 2040, we, I mean, this is the, the main, I mean, indoor to our Dukum talks, where Dukum is a key uh, pillar in Oman 2040 vision. And uh, in Dukum, I mean, there's two things. One, the port of Dukum, but the second point of it, I mean, uh, second part of it, it's not, I mean, Dukum, it's not a part. There is a special economic zone, which is behind the port itself. It is uh, the largest economic zone in the Middle East uh, with 2,000 uh, kilo, kilo, uh, square kilometers. Already the government spent around eight, point, eight to nine billion dollars in the infrastructure down in the uh, economic zone. Uh, the economic, uh, the, the government expenditure was mainly into the ports and they they build more than I mean, it's, it's uh, two two ports mainly one for the heavy industrial uh, port which is the port of Tokom and there are some fisheries other ports for other industries which are like fisheries as well built there 
uh, I mean, the main, uh, I mean, model which uh, CZ, which is the special economic zone of Dukum, which CZ built on, it is the multiple business and multiple business strategy. This is 2,000 uh, I mean, square kilometer. They are divided into main uh, eight main areas between heavy industry areas, uh, I mean, medium industry areas, low industry areas, so on and so forth. Uh, as well, I mean, we can see, I mean, uh, there is there is a, a slight change or there is, I mean, a big change happened in their strategies to, to go toward the hydrogen and the green energies because they, I mean, CZ area, they found that, I mean, there are mainly four to five main uh, criteria to be suitable globally to be one of the hydrogen molecule uh, area where the main criteria is where to, to be a windy solar uh, area as well access to water to use the hydrogen out of the oxygen and so forth and as well to have access to the port and there are just i mean five to six main places in the globe which are considered as potential areas for hydrogen and, and for hydrogen business. I'm not saying that the rest are not eligible, but I'm saying those are the highest five potential, which is Saudi, Chile, and Dokom is one of those. So we can see as well, I mean, uh, I mean, there are a lot of potentials and uh, a lot of boxes which Dokom is ticking. But as, as I mean, my colleague, Dr. Hafiz, he said, and I'll, uh, I'll, take, I'll take it from here. I mean, that's just an understanding about, about the area. But I mean, as he said, the connectivity with the others and the cooperation with the others, that which really, really will develop and take whatever infrastructure, either a port, either, I mean, any logistic hub to, the, to be operational and effective. I mean, yeah, we can, I mean, we can put on the table that Dukum main main I mean uh, advantages in Dukum a part of being I mean I mean main political advantages yes it's out of the Strait of Hormuz it has the land it has the land border with the entire GCC which I think I mean the rest the rest of the of the of uh, the rest of the ports they don't I mean the rest of the ports in the Arab uh, Gulf, they don't have it. As well, uh, I think, uh, I mean, being GCC being one of the highest, I mean, supply of the oil, with the connectivity of already, I mean, some pipelines in the, in, I mean, between the Gulf, that will make uh, Dukum easily to position itself as an, uh, as an hub for logistic within the GCC, but. I mean, having said all of that, we cannot uh, ignore uh, mainly the political situation which we are facing abroad, where we can see, I mean, despite, I mean, having this closure within the GCC, but we are as well thinking, I mean, GCC always can, can I mean, GCC countries can be really a good hand for the short to mid term. But I mean, looking to the recent past, what happened within the Gulf Corporation, we need to really think about how sustainable is that support can be to Oman. Because without the sustainability of these relations and support, as well, I mean, the volatility will be very high into areas like a Dukum. And that volatility, which I mean, will not be, uh, wanted or liked by the investors as well i mean uh, as well i think uh, the current uh, yemen situation resolution that will brought to i mean if that if that resolved any any time soon that will brought two main ports as well to the picture despite if they are out of the uh, strait of babel mandab but but there's a big support will be to Port of Al Fatayda uh, down in in uh, in, uh, in Yemen, which will be potential uh, compet competitor 
to a dukum as well i mean uh, the 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 investment or some influence of chinese which is happening in the in africa's uh, i mean southeastern africans ports as well those are considered in our in, uh, i mean uh, should be considered in the eyes of dukum port we can see that oman the larger uh, i mean in the in the larger picture especially toward uh, africa they are uh, trying to get into those some partnership with china at least to have some influence and cooperation level with dukum i think as well i mean before going to that to that side of the of, of the of the of the, of the of the of the geographical uh, location which is i mean uh, africa is considered mainly as a bigger nowadays since it's 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 going into the development it's a bigger uh, demand rather than being a bigger supply at the moment and so therefore i mean we need to have a hub of supplies across i mean gawadar across dukum and as well across al uh, hudaida port and 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 all of these if we can see i mean are linked to the chinese and iranians uh, political i mean uh, movement in the region and at the moment we can see all of these relations are being under discussion due to a lot of different reasons and changes happening either due to i mean what we are facing as a different uh, strategy from biden toward the middle east either what what we are waiting from the iranian cha- i mean change in the presidency but to be honest i mean what will be coming out of these discussions that will be uh, i mean a, 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 a play mover and a play change if there is a real change will happen and i i mean to be honest i don't want to be pessimistic but still we cannot see that 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 encouraging discussion are happening around especially i mean with the reluctance which we are which we are indicating in, with houthis and iranians and in, in yemeni situation that's not indicating any progressive any prog- progressive discussion is happening even though in the, in the in the other discussions and if we will be relying on all of this discussion and putting the stake of the success of our uh, i mean of infrastructure toward this discussion that will be high risky so therefore the only way out and I'll conclude it with the same idea which just came from our colleague without the cooperation between ourselves i mean as as being an independent uh, independent ports uh, without our cooperation together and supporting each ourselves and having the strategy of of uh, uh, co- cooperation competition we cannot uh, succeed i think uh, i'm almost done with my time if i did not take more and we can uh, we can have the rest of discussion later in any qa sessions thank you so much dr yusuf al balushi for really adding on to uh, what uh, dr hafiz jamali said and we are now already seeing Uh, some similarities appearing between these ports as well where both gawadar and dukum appear as part of a larger national project to increase regional connectivity and the success of both uh, our speakers have suggested depends on the degree to which these states can bring together their regional neighbors to increase regional cooperation and trade with that we go on to our third speaker for today dr mohsin soldost who will talk about iran and chabahar port development well hello good afternoon everyone uh, first i would like to thank also the organizers for this interesting webinar and also uh, thank the previous panelists for the interesting presentations so i'm going to share the screen with you here So I guess you've got the full screen, not the one with notes. I think so. I think so. We don't see the notes. So I think if you do oh, the okay. next slide, we can confirm. 
All right. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Iran's uh, jugular vein. The Persian Gulf is known as Iran's jugular vein and the port of uh, Chabahar, how it matters and uh, how can we actually understand uh, why it matters to the original powers as well as major powers, great powers from other regions of the war. So the Indo-Pacific region, and we're talking about these three choke points, Chabahar, Gwadar, and Dog. And uh, we can see how these three are closely actually connected to each other and how the Persian Gulf is actually going to be connected to the Indo-Pacific region through these uh, three choke points. And uh, in order to understand how the politics of these choke points and in order to understand how actually the original powers as well as the great powers are involved in the politics of the region, I'm going to lay down this conceptual framework for us to uh, understand a little bit better why particular actors are playing in a particular way in, uh, in the Persian Gulf region and in the Indo-Pacific in region. So we've got this well-known saying that the strong do what they have the power to do and the weak accept what they have to accept. That's where a famous quote from Thucydides they uh, historical story about how actually great powers act in international politics. So the conceptual framework that, in my opinion, helps us best to understand the choke point politics is uh, what I'm going to lay out here. We need to have a look at the concept of power as well as interest. We need to define who are the great powers. We need to understand who are the original states. So. When we talk about great powers, we are basically talking about those uh, United States and China, the great powers who are actually competing in the region. When we talk about the regional states, we are talking about the middle powers, such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and uh, those which are not great powers uh, in international politics, yet in the region, they are uh, rival powers or great powers in the region. So we also have to define the interests what are the interests of these states? We, uh, in international politics, we do have vital interests and secondary interests. Vital interests are about any issues related to a state's security, its power, its survival, or its status in the system. States are willing to engage militarily to fight for these vital interests in order to either preserve them or enhance them in, on the international stage. For example, territorial integrity, natural resources are vital interests. So if we look at the regional states, it is Iran, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia. For these regional states, natural resources are vital interests. Secondary interests are those that are unlikely to affect a state's security, its power, or its economy, or its political status in the system. And states are unlikely to engage militarily in these issues. So we see that both great powers, such as the United States and China, and the regional states are willing to engage militarily in this region, basically because these natural resources are considered vital interests for both the great powers that are involved in the region and the regional states. And uh, we also have to take into consideration that the roles that these regional states as well as great powers are playing in the region are practically or factually available for them uh, uh, depending on their power position and its power relative to that of other states. As I mentioned, Iran is not a great power in the international system, yet it is a great regional power uh, in our case. So now that we know the stakeholders are great powers and the regional states and they are all, we are talking about the vital interest, the natural resources in the region, we can also talk about the regions of the world that matter most to different states. So the regions of the world that matter to middle powers, such as Iran or Pakistan, it is their immediate neighborhood or it is the critical resources in the immediate neighborhoods. So you might uh, see that, okay, that's how Iran is trying to exert its influence over the Persian Gulf region. 
how Iran is trying to dominate what is happening in the region and how Iran has tried to uh, actually exert an influence, its influence and how to play as a great power in the region in its own immediate neighborhood. And uh, in, uh, when it is just about the critical resources in the Persian Gulf. For great powers, the regions that matter to them in addition to their immediate neighborhood, for example, for the United States, the Western Hemisphere is what matters to them the most. They've got this Monroe Doctrine. No other great power is actually welcomed into the Western Hemisphere because the United States doesn't like them to see there. So it is their immediate neighborhood and uh, regions with other great powers matter to, matter to them too. For example, South China Sea is one of those places. The Persian Gulf is one of those places uh, where all these great powers uh, are very much involved in because these regions matter to them. Regions with critical resources like oil, it is again Iraq, uh, in the Middle East, uh, the Persian Gulf region. This, is, uh, actually, this actually adds to the categories, what, what really matters to the great powers. And the reason I am actually laying out this conceptual framework through which we can look at what is happening in the, in the, in the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf region and the Indo-Pacific region is that you might have heard stories, for example, about how great powers have been willing to uh, militarily engage in these regions. This is how the United States actually is trying to control these oil fields in Syria. This is how they try actually to have their military presence in north of Iraq because of the oil. So with these theoretical concepts, it is also interesting to see that uh, the concept of power, interest, and regional significance uh, also matters in policymaking. So uh, a month ago, May 10th, we had this Strategic Competition Act in US Congress. Uh, it is the Strategic Competition Act of 2021, where the U.S. Congress was uh, is actually trying to focus on a number of issues, which is about a number of competition issues between U.S. and China. One of them, or the most important of them, is the partnership between China and Iran. So that's why I tried to define those conceptual frameworks, saying that, okay, that's how uh, the, uh, if we are trying to understand the politics of the choke points, we have to see why these stakeholders are willing to engage and uh, to what length they're willing to go to accommodate their interests in the region. So these are the issues that have uh, actually constituted the US-China competition in the region. Uh, within 180 days after the enactment of this act, it's already one month past, a report on cooperation between China and Iran should be drafted. And the U.S. is pretty much concerned with what is China doing in order to reshape the current international order, how China is trying to seek to uh, redefine international laws and norms to align with the objectives of the Chinese Communist Party, how China is trying to co-opt the leadership and agenda of multinational organizations for the benefit of uh, China and other uh, partners in the region, such as Iran at the expense of the interests of the United States and uh, its European allies. So US is pretty much concerned that China is executing a plan to establish regional hegemony over the Indo-Pacific and displace the United States from the region. Uh, and this is all in addition to what uh, uh, China has been doing uh, about the island building, the, the issues related to Taiwan, expanding China's military capabilities, the Blue Water Navy that, uh, that China is expanding. And uh, in the Strategic Competition Act, we saw that there was this explicit reference to JCPOA. And the JCPOA, which is also known as the Iran nuclear deal, 2015 Iran nuclear deal, was actually uh, an agreement between Iran, P5 plus one, security members of the Security Council, based in which Iran tried to expand its uh, economic commercial relations with other partners in the region, as well as great powers. So after the Iran nuclear deal, Iran 
decided to pursue the policy of engagement with China and India, particularly in the region. And uh, why Iran tried to engage both China and India was because Iran could pretty much leverage, uh, uh, have some leverage against both of them, trying to play them off each other when there was some uh, deals, business deals between them. One important point was the, that India became interested to invest in the Chabahar port. Iran started to uh, actually uh, participate in India's inter international north-south port corridor and the Chinese investment as part of BR BRI started in Iran. So the reason I mentioned the JCPOA was that again, how the great powers politics has actually affected the politics of these choke points in the region. So uh, if we are trying to understand the choke points, uh, these, how these choke points could be actually best used by the countries, how we can expand the cooperation and collaboration between the states, we have to look at how these powers are engaged in, in the region. So India, as the world's largest uh, energy consumer that imports over 80% of its oil and half of its total gas consumption, uh, has actually kept a close watch on the impact of the 2015 nuclear deal on the global energy markets. As Iran offered competitive gas pricing, India also expressed interest in constructing a liquefied natural gas plant and a gas cracker in Chabahar port on the Persian Gulf. And this was not just for economic reasons, based on what I previously mentioned about the conceptual framework, uh, in the previous slides, Chabahar has both strategic and commercial value for both uh, foreign, uh, for foreign investors and regional powers. It is a strategic, a strategic port that in the absence of a land route through Pakistan to Central Asia has been considered as the golden gate to the landlocked Commonwealth of Independent States, Afghanistan, and has the potential to connect the business hubs of the Middle East to South Asian countries such as India and also Central Asia and Afghanistan. On the one hand, India used its investment in the Chabahar port as a counterweight to China's pursuit of string of pearls, a strategy that seeks to contain both uh, land as well as maritime footprint of India through developing military and commercial routes such as Pakistan's Gwadar uh, in the region, and on the other hand, used its keen uh, interest in the Iranian oil uh, as a leverage with other sellers, particularly Saudi Arabia. So different stakeholders in the region are pretty much using these choke points as a leverage against each other. They all would like to have a better deal for business. And uh, for example, on China-Pakistan economic corridor, the CPEC, uh, which, was a, which is a $46 billion infrastructure program that was signed between China and Pakistan in 2015 and connects Pakistan's port of Gwadar to China's uh, Kashgar. Uh, we saw that while China welcomed Iran's participation in the CPEC uh, to thwart India's original strategic ambitions, Iran also used its involvement in this China-Pakistan project as a leverage in its negotiations with India. In addition, India's uh, decision to get involved in Chabahar was uh, also informed by Pakistan's uh, so-called unfriendly posture towards both India and Afghanistan. So Iran took advantage of India's interest in, uh, in, it, in the infrastructure in Chabahar and oil gas investments uh, to strike better deals with China. So see how interrelated and interconnected all these business deals with, uh, within these, uh, this network of stakeholders uh, is. So in other words, Iran kept leveraging China and India's interest in investing in Iran's oil and gas industry, as well as infrastructure projects at the bargaining table with both of them. Uh, for example, there was a very interesting example that I'm, I'm just going to mention here. In early July 2020, unofficial statements from Iran uh, came out saying that, uh, okay, uh, at the time Iran was still fully complying with the US sanctions on Iran, was expecting India to uh, fulfill its commitment uh, with regards to Chabahar project. So Iran's ambassador to Pakistan raised the issue of connectivity between the sister ports of Gwadar, developed by China, and Chabahar, considered by India as a counterpoint to China's increasing influence in the region. 
Iran pretty much hinted that it was likely that China could replace India in the Chabahar project. The desired effect of prompting India not to delay its investment was created. So within a couple of weeks, the Indian ambassador to Tehran met with Iran's parliament speaker in order to reinforce their position, boost the bilateral ties, and review the cooperation on the Chabahar project. So Iran has pretty much used uh, all these negotiations with China and India, particularly about the, the, uh, the Chabahar port as a bargaining chip on the table. And uh, there, I also explained how this uh, actual investment in these choke points in Gwadar, uh, Chabahar and Dorn could have these geopolitical implications for Central Asia. That's why we saw when uh, there was the project between Iran and India was uh, being signed uh, the Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani, was also present in Tehran, attending the event, trying to attract the attention of the Iranian and Indian uh, uh, leaders for further investment in Afghanistan. So uh, that's how the politics of choke points are pretty much explained, uh, as I mentioned. So we need to have to look at the concept of power, the interests, and how each of these stakeholders in the region particularly in the Persian Gulf region, uh, are trying to accommodate their interests based on their power relative to other stakeholders in the region. And with the, I'll finish here and then I'll be happy to answer the questions if there are any of you in the Q&A. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohsin, for giving us perhaps uh, in the other side of the coin to what Yusuf and Hafiz highlighted, that in addition to increased cooperation, what these ports might bring in also is competition within the region or competition for attracting trade. Um, before we open up into the question answers, I wanna take a few minutes, perhaps like five to 10 minutes to, uh, to situate this current dynamics within a historical perspective. I've always personally found it very useful to, to understand any, any sort of new problem that comes in. If you took, take a look at history, you'll always find sort of similar examples, similar cases being resolved. Um, and and with, ocean, with, with Indian Ocean, the story of new cities coming to power and old cities rising is an old story. Um, uh, Dr. Hafiz mentioned Gavadar itself used to be in pre-colonial times and even in, in somewhat in colonial times, an important terminal or important um, uh, hub along this larger node of, of Omani trade and Indian Ocean trade more broadly. Um, and, and behind this fact that cities came and cities, cities, cities died along the coast, which for somebody who's living in old cities or ancient cities in the hinterland might seem like an odd phenomena, but in the ocean, it's a normal thing because of the very simple fact, and I'm here, I'm sort of simplifying it, that a trader, all the traders could have who are very mobile people have the option of relocating from one place to another, from one port to another, depending on which port offers them basically um, uh, less, less taxes and a safe enough environment and, and somewhat some modicum of law and order or sort of a legal resource of sort. And this was the sort of the dynamics of the Indian Ocean where you had cities coming and rising and also even sort of other areas like Mediterranean and so on. Um, but this, this dynamic somewhat started to change with the rise of the Portuguese empire. Now we sort of, you know, you forget about these moments and it, but, but it was for the first time when we see that the Portuguese married the flag and the gun to the boat. So these, the, the Portuguese ships went not just as traders at earliest people went, but as flag carrying and gun carrying sovereigns who had the right to make war when the deal did not suit them. Uh, but more importantly, what changed with the right of Portuguese that they, they were no longer interested only in building these cities and attracting trade on the basis of lower taxes and better sort of protection, but they also tried to control important choke points or places along the sea where the sea sort of um, narrowed down, bottlenecks of sort. 
And by controlling these bottlenecks, they laid claim to controlling this, the seas at large. I mean, the Portuguese were the first to call themselves you know, the protectors of the free seas. It was a title that later the British inherited, um, the Dutch did for a while too, the British inherited. And now we have the Americans who call themselves the guardians of the free seas as well. And as part of the, you know, the role of the guardian, they run these freedom of navigation seas program, which is to safeguard the all the seas are open, which no other sea, you know, country is allowed to run except the US. But behind the sort of you know, image of free trade is the fact that these countries or these great powers, as Dr. Mohsin also pointed out, managed to control key choke points in the Straits of Hormuz, around the Horn of Africa, in the Mediterranean, and even far or further away in, in the Pacific. By doing so, they laid, they, they, they created a certain kind of monopoly where everything that went in and, and came out uh, went through these choke points. Now, uh, the, the, the issue with, with these, and of course, because this, this seems that the fact that trade, that the, this choke point seems so natural to us that we forget that it was a peculiar thing that came about at a certain point in time due to this marriage of, of, of uh, the ship being married to both the flag and the, and the cannon. Um, this choke point politics, one of the impacts, one of the after effects of this was that, that because choke points are places that are easy to, con uh, that are easier to monitor, there are also places, uh, quite ironically, that are easier to attack. Um, and we've seen sort of, you know, from, from the history of piracy and even from, the, uh, from current tensions in the Persian Gulf, really, that these are places that because they're sort of bottlenecks, uh, anyone who's left out or the opponents can also lay rival things and they can easily sort of slow down global trade by attacking these choke points, which has always meant that these choke points have been heavily militarized zones. And they have been heavily militarized. And no, there's perhaps no better example of this than, than the Persian Gulf itself, where you have um, you know, UAE and Saudi Arabia and to some extent Iran, which are UAE and Saudi Arabia in particular, which are two countries that spend the largest amounts on military imports. And this is, of course, in addition to the already present US military bases in this region. If you, if you, you know, open up a map of the military bases in this region, you'd see almost all of the, there, there's, a con, there's a major concentration of military bases uh, within, inside the choke point or sort of control in trying to control the choke point, both in straight foremost, but even if you look towards the Horn of Africa, we see a similar situation. Uh, where you, it, a country like Djibouti is home to multiple military bases. And sort of, so, so this, this choke point dynamics in many ways has been for the past 200 years sort of a defining feature of global politics. Um, but what is interesting for us now, and one of the major reasons that we, we organize this panel is to see sort of alternative imaginations, alternative possibilities that might emerge with the rise of these new ports can we perhaps see a shift towards a dynamic where you again have this rise and fall of ports and a rise and sort of you know economics perhaps taking the dominance over these kind of more security concerns and it was interesting to note in in like all in all three of the talks that we got strong mentions of of the fact that these ports themselves are will not be enough that the the port like no port in itself, it's enough. Ports are only meaningful as, as nodes in longer connections. So success of a port depends on its ability to attract a larger network. And of course, the fact that these, you know, the, 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 simply, the simple geographical fact that these ports are no longer within the, the straits does not necessarily mean that they are without choke points. And perhaps with that, I want to start uh, the start the 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 question on such session with with the first question that even if there is no the, even if we don't have a physical choke point in the same way as the Strait of Hormuz, it seemed clear to me from the, the three talks that they were uh, they were choke points of different kinds in all of the three cases with uh, with Gavadar we see one of the major choke points uh, being the, um, the fact that, that this, this port it, it only functions if uh, there is a, is, is a land connectivity towards China. And with, um, with, with Dukum, um, as Dr. Yusuf pointed out, that its success dependent on the cooperations of other GCC countries. Only if other GCC countries are able to supply oil and reroute some of their traffic to this area, does the Dukum port make sense? And with Dr. Mohsin's, we saw with, uh, with, with Chabahar, 
uh, a similar situation as a bottleneck uh, sort of emerging with let's say even, even with GCPOA or these geopolitical tensions where only if these resolution, these tensions are resolved and there's some permission that, that, that we can get greater trade. But with that, I wanted, I know you three have mentioned it, 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 it to some extent. I want to um, ask if you could elaborate, if the three of us, you could elaborate a little bit more of what you see as the major choke point, be it more metaphorically or as, as, as physically in the success or in the rise of these, these three ports respectively. Um, if we could start, we could, we could start with Dr. We could you know, go the other way around. Dr. Mohsin, if you want to take the first step at the question. Sure. Uh, can you just uh, state the question again? The yeah, I was last the question. Get... Yes, the mm -hmm. question that I was asking about: What do you think is the main bottleneck in the success of these ports? What is the main restrict point? Like, the, if 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 that could be cleared, then or sort of the choke point or bottleneck in the success of Chabar Port. Uh, I think uh, it is very difficult to give a clear answer to that because. Uh, on top of the economic or the commercial value of these points that we're discussing, there are deeply seated uh, strategic concerns of all these states you mentioned about Saudi Arabia and UAE uh, buying all those weapons more than any other country in the region. Saudi Arabia is a top buyer of arms in the world, not only in the region. So uh, it is very difficult to say that even if we are staying out of the Strait of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf region, whether the Dugan port or the Gwadar port could pretty much bypass that particular region so that there is less tension. I hardly uh, believe that it's going to work because Iran is, tr is trying pretty much to expand its Navy so that it is trying to expand its missile program so that there, there is uh, uh, at least 2000 kilometers within the reach of Iranian missiles. So. Uh, expanding these ports, particularly if, if, if we talk about, again, the strategic, particular strategic uh, interests of all these states here in the region, uh, could not be enough unless all the states in the region could actually benefit from what is available to everyone. We cannot deny these opportunities to one particular state in the region and expect that everything goes right. Uh, even though it is outside the Persian Gulf region, e even though it is not going through the Strait of Hormuz, I uh, doubt that it's going to work if we say that, okay, we're going to, let's say, block the Strait of Hormuz, we're going to uh, stay out of the Strait of Hormuz, and at the same time, we are denying Iran the opportunity to engage uh, in economic activities with other states. Uh, there will be still some tensions I would say uh, in the region, and uh, given all these three ports are pretty close to Iran, and uh, not 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 close to Iran, even close to the proxies. We know that in the region we've got different proxies uh, that are actually fighting for different states in the region. We've got Saudi proxies, we've got proxies working for UAE, we've got proxies working for Iran. So it is very difficult to imagine that we could have some safe routes for doing business and commerce uh, if we are bypassing the Strait of Hormuz. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, uh, if you would like to take a stab at the question as well about what is the main bottleneck in the development of the Comport. Uh, Okay, thank you, Dr. Ramim, and thank you, Dr. Mohsen. I think from my point of view, I mean, uh, I mean I'll, I'll not add a lot onto the connectivity ideas since it's really clear, but the connectivity is really vital uh, toward how much we are connected into the three main regions, back into the GCC, up into the new ports and, the, and, the, and, the, and Asia, I mean, especially in Gawadar and Chahbar, and down into Africa. But as well, I think the ports, end of the day, are just the interfaces to the sea. And all of these ports, I mean, should have its own up and midstream of projects and infrastructure. How they can move, I mean, either, either I mean, the productions or they can, they, they, they can I mean, uh, have the logistics 
which is behind the ports itself to support uh, the, the I, mean, I mean to support the added value of the port and which is in this case I can see it I mean in majority in the majority of uh, of the three uh, ports which we are talking about all of them are attached and embedded with different projects it just depends either these projects some of them are linked to other countries where this is a real check choke point if those are uh, i mean linked to other countries and sometimes no as long as uh, those are really into the zones which is surrounded like like i can i can just uh, remind myself of jabal ali port and jabal ali free zone i would make the success wow. of being really uh, I mean, uh, sustainable by whatever production and links, which is already they have within the UAE itself. So that's allowed them to be a bit sustainable. And I think uh, the third point, the diversification of two things, how you can diversify the power and and diversify the economic models. So we can, we can, we can talk about these things, I mean, business-wise where we should diversify the production, but as well, the most important thing, diversification of the power in, in those lands. So we cannot have, I mean, we cannot have just the US military there or just the UK military there, I mean, from the security point of view, as long as we can welcome and accommodate uh, I mean, diversified uh, powers into our region that really, really uh, will help their businesses and their and their trust to be on the ground, which will absolutely pay off as an uh, uh, as an as as an real investment and added value to the global supply chain. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fisamali. Uh, I think you, yes, yeah, no, we can hear you now. Um, so, uh, yes, sort of building on, uh, and uh, thank you for asking that uh, very good question. Um, and building on what uh, my colleague, Dr. Albalushi, said earlier, uh, some of the um, choke points, uh, you know, vis a vis the Gawadar port were, um, uh, at least in the past, were internal to Pakistan. So for, as, as uh, Dr. Al-Balushi said, and I will re rephrase it in a different way, that a port without connectivity in the hinterland is like a maroon ship. It cannot get you anywhere, you know? Uh, so vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis Gawadar, one of the issues with, uh, you know, with the Pakistani planning machinery or uh, our planning machinery here in Pakistan, was that while the port was very uh, quickly built, you know, it was construction started somewhere in 2002, March 2002, and you know, uh, by the by 2007, the port was complete. But the connectivity uh, of Gawadar, uh, both via road, uh, road and rail, took much longer. So you know, the sort of the utility of uh, the asset that was created was you know sort of uh, decreased because of that. You know, but the one is sort of, you know, the pure sort of physical connective um, dimension. Similarly, in terms of uh, energy connectivity, um, the uh, Makran grid uh, still sort of uh, relies on, uh, you know, power supply from our uh, Iranian friends. You know, we get sort of 150 megawatts of power uh, from Iran um, uh, for Gawadar and, you know, uh, some other parts of Makran region. And Makran was, uh, until recently, was not connected with the main Pakistani national grid. So, so there were sort of, you know, some basic, you know, planning uh, problems or flaws, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, sort of the uh, development of other port, which, uh, which have now, you know, uh, uh, at least under the current uh, government, have been addressed. So there is an ambitious program of connecting uh, uh, the Makran grid with the broader national grid. There's a 300 megawatt coal power plant that is sort of, you know, uh, is likely to be uh, completed in the next two years. And uh, similarly, at the institutional level, 
you know, uh, the uh, customs arrangement and other, you know, such arrangements have been, uh, you know, made uh, sort of brought online, you know, so through the VBOX system. So, uh, so, you know, there's a physical uh, connectivity dimensions, uh, the optic fiber uh, link uh, with the uh, national uh, optic fiber uh, uh, main artery has been connected. So, you know, so those, you know, uh, link and, 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 and beyond the connectivity with China itself, you know, the main CPEC Eastern alignment uh, is near completion. And similarly, the Western corridor, which was a demand of the local people is also sort of, you know, near completion. So that's, that's one aspect that is being, you know, uh, that is being addressed, but that those ambitious uh, energy and infra, and then of course we have the big uh, the big ticket item, which is the uh, ML1 railway line, which is sort of costing close to you know eight billion uh, US dollars, you know, uh, which is you know uh, being finalized and could not be finalized for a long time, because the uh, problem partly for from Pakistan's perspective is that uh, infrastructure comes at a price. It requires huge investments, you know, uh, uh, you know, taking on a, a loan, even if it is a concessional loan of 8 billion US dollars, is not a joke, you know, uh, is not a light step. So, you know, uh, so many of those, for example, under, uh, under CPEC, uh, under the current government, uh, there has been an extensive uh, deliberation with our Chinese uh, brothers to, you know, structure uh, these CPEC investments in a way that reduces the uh, debt servicing burden on Pakistani side, you know? So that's sort of, you know, one, one aspect. Another aspect has been, you know, the uh, Pakistani central government's relationship with the, uh, with the local Baloch people. So in the earlier part of the planning process, the original Gawadar master plan of 2003, it was uh, rather ill-conceived, I would say. It was designed by an engineering firm, which had very little uh, experience of uh, urban planning. And the kind of changes it, it proposed were really not suited to the, uh, you know, um, the um, uh, attitudes or uh, expectations of the local population, which led to a lot of resentment. So that's another dimension on which the Pakistani government has been working. So for example, um, uh, they have come up with a new uh, Gawadar Smart, uh, government has come up with a new Gawadar Smart Port City Master Plan, uh, you know, which uh, takes a more dynamic approach to the development of the city. And, you know, there is uh, uh, there's a specific component of the plan uh, which focuses on the development of the older part of the city where most of the fishermen and other, uh, you know, uh, um, local people live and earn their livelihood. Similarly, you know, there were concerns about the expressway project, which was connecting the port with the hinterland. And again, you know, the prime minister intervened by uh, asking to build, uh, you know, passages across that, you know, to facilitate the fishermen. Uh, the provincial government has uh, come up with a huge investment of uh, almost uh, 2.5 billion uh, rupees, Pakistani rupees, to improve the sewerage and sanitation of the old town of Kowadar. Um, similarly, the, um, you know, the federal government has recently approved uh, close to 4 billion uh, US dollars to, you know, sort of upgrade the uh, electricity and municipal infrastructure in, in Gawadar town and, you know, availability of water. Because, you know, let, let's not forget that these mega projects, these large scale infrastructure projects are kind of like, ele like elephants, you know, they put a uh, huge footprint on the ground and they drink a lot of water, you know. And you know many of these parts will be at Chabahar or Gawadar, and they are like water stressed places. You know, so you know the pressure. The third thing that the Pakistani government has been trying to do is to adopt a more balanced and inclusive approach to regional partners. So, for example, a Pakistani premier has visited Iran multiple times to hold direct, you know, talks with uh, President uh, Rouhani. You know. Uh, Pakistan decided to uh, commence fencing of its border with Iran to allay Iranian concerns, you know, um, and uh, they, uh, right now, uh, the federal government is embarked on an ambitious plan of formalizing the uh, informal cross-border trade, if you know, from uh, uh, Iran, Iran um, border. Hello? So, we can hear you, yeah. 
Thank you. So, uh, so you know, there are uh, at least uh, eleven border crossings, official border crossings, uh, planned with the on the Pakistan-Iran border to facilitate, you know, formal trade, you know, uh, across the two uh, borders. And even, you know, both countries have offered each other, and they're actively thinking of connecting uh, Chabahar and Gwadar via uh, road link as well. You know, so so those are. Uh, similarly, Pakistan has brought, uh, tried to bring Saudi Arabia on board. Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, the uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman visited uh, Gawadar, uh, Pakistan, and, you know, an oil refinery and oil cities planned, you know, in the hinterland of Gawadar with Saudi assistance. Um, uh, 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 in the same way, Pakistan has reached out to uh, Afghanistan and Central Asian countries. Uh, we have re we have recently you know Pakistan is uh, having uh, negotiating with Uzbekistan to uh, establish a rail link you know which would connect uh, you know uh, Tirmis with uh, the terminus of uh, Pakistan's main railway line at Peshawar you know uh, to make it so to, uh, to allow to use the Karachi and go other ports for its you know uh, transshipment of its goods. Um, in, uh, you know, so in the same way, Pakistan is uh, is routing Afghan transit trade to through Gwadar. You know, so the Afghan traders and cargos don't have to uh, uh, wait for a long time at Gwadar at Karachi, where, where you know, which is a much more busier uh, port. So, so, um, uh, so those are one of the things that perhaps is still uh, is is you could say a weak point of Pakistani strategy is is to have. A, a broader level of uh, engagement, you know, uh, come up with a, and, and sort of uh, let me not, for, uh, uh, let's not forget that uh, recent, uh, this year, Pakistan has also announced an ambitious development uh, program for uh, Southern Balochistan, uh, which is primarily de developed, de directed towards improving infrastructure and livelihoods, so dams, roads, and, you know, other things for these coastal, for the coastal belt, you know, so the people sort of, you know, have, uh, you know, their grievances are, are, are addressed. Uh, one of the things that is perhaps missing from this strategy is a, a, a broader political framework, you know, uh, you know, uh, which uh, engages uh, different political parties, uh, you know, who uh, represent those uh, grievances of local people, you know, uh, into a, a, a broader political uh, deal, which, uh, uh, you know, which addresses sort of issues of uh, land rights, uh, rights over mineral resources. Although those many of those concerns are enshrined within the 18th Amendment passed by Pakistani legislature, but they have to be operationalized, and some of those things have to be elaborated. And 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 more ironclad assurances at the political level have to be provided to the uh, regional uh, political parties uh, hailing from Balochistan. Uh, such as Balochistan National Party uh, of Akhtar Mengal and, you know, the National Party led by the former Chief Minister, Dr. Malik Baloch, as well as, you know, elements, who, you know, of uh, who have been sort of uh, involved with the ethno-nationalist insurgency in the province, you know, whose leadership is sitting abroad. So uh, a, 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 a more comprehensive political framework, you know, that sort of ties together all of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, efforts that Pakistan federal government has been making, uh, you know, to uh, to address you know concerns or reservations around the other, both internally within Pakistan as well as vis-a-vis -vis its external partners. So that I think, you know, apart from the physical connectivity and you know that 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 to me is an effective uh, uh, what you call a choke point or an effective um, bottleneck, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm of, you know, the long-term future of the Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we will now take uh, questions. So anyone who has questions can, of course, send it to me or the MEI events team, and I will read it out to you. Or if anyone so wishes, they could also raise their hand and ask the, and unmute themselves and ask the question directly as well. Uh, we have one question to begin with, and it kind of grows from... Uh, the comment that Dr. Afiz Jamali made. Um, and it's a question from uh, Rajesh uh, Basru, who's a senior fellow, RSIS Singapore. He asks that there's a tendency to see choke points in zero sum conflict of interest terms, but there are also sites of interdependent interests. This becomes clear from the recent accidental blockage of the Suez Canal, which imposed high cost to economies globally, 
by disrupting supply chain. Is there any move to try and manage choke points through a multilateral cooperative effort? Um, so if any of you would like to take that question about, uh, are there any real efforts being made to build these regional or multilateral coalitions around these new ports as well? Dr. Mohsin, you would, would you like to? Uh, I can uh, perhaps add a little bit uh, about what Iran has recently proposed for the past couple of years. Iran proposed this comprehensive security pact for the Strait of Hormuz. It's called Hormuz Initiative, trying to involve regional powers instead of great powers from outside the region, providing security for the Strait of Hormuz, for the Persian Gulf region, including these uh, uh, ports that we are discussing now. But the problem is that we see that these regional initiatives or what is actually proposed by these regional powers are not very much uh, uh, welcomed by other states in the region. And it is, again, because of the influence of the powers outside the region. While, for example, there is a regional state offering that, OK, we can have this security pact for us and we can be all involved in providing security to the region. Uh, just in February, we saw that United States actually seized this uh, oil tanker, which was carrying Iranian oil in February. And then they sold, uh, they took the oil to Texas. They sold the oil for $110 million and then they gave it to, uh, they, they, it was done under this anti-terrorism law in the United States. So we see that this, uh, let's say intervention in the region by these great powers is working as a major setback to any regional initiative uh, because this oil was actually seized on the Fujairah uh, port in uh, UAE. And Iran was very much unhappy with that because uh, UAE actually allowed that to happen. So we see that all this intervention by the great powers in the region is pretty much exacerbated the situation in the region. We have this regional somehow. I'm not saying that it, that it, it is really the ideal situation or that uh, the initiative proposed by Iran is going to work well. But what I'm saying is that because we've got stakeholders from outside the region who are exerting their influence and they are very much powerful and they're, they have effective policies that pretty much disrupts any regional pact or cooperation between the states in the region, we don't see much progress in cooperation between the states in the region. Like India was trying to invest in, in Chabahar port, again, because of the US pulling out of the nuclear deal, imposing sanctions on all those countries that are doing any business with Iran, pretty much forced India to get out of the Chabahar port or pretty much suspended the cooperation between Iran and India. So, uh, the problem for in the region is perhaps one of, one of the major problems is that uh, any cooperation or let's say commercial uh, collaboration between these countries is highly politicized or excessively securitized by the powers that are outside the region. Otherwise, we would see per perhaps a, the development of the Chabahar port. We could see uh, pretty good cooperation between Pakistan and Iran. Uh, the pipeline that Dr. Jamali pointed to was pretty much suspended because of the imposition of the sanctions by the United States, which, by the way, violated the terms and conditions of a multilateral uh, nuclear disarmament agreement, which was upheld by all parties except the United States. So these are the issues that uh, uh, perhaps these are out of control of those states in the region. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are running short of time, so I'll ask the, the, the respondents to be quick. We'll take, I think this might be the last question, or we can take one more. Um, Danish Sultan asks, uh, uh, there's two questions. One is about what is the time, is there any um, the, like timeline for the Iran, Pakistan, and India gas pipeline? And the second question is, uh, perhaps Dr. Uh, Yusuf Al-Balushi, you could, you could take it, is about is there any possibility of an era of uh, of an intra GCC coalition that does not necessarily always look to the West or looks for uh, you know possibly other regional partners than partners than than Europe or the US? Uh, 
Okay, so I will start with the with the second question. Uh, I mean, what what I can see at the moment. I mean, uh, what's what's happening about the interrelation between uh, between the GCC? I I cannot see it very. I mean, in, in the short to mid term, it's happening. Uh, I mean, due to due to two two to three main reasons. One, I mean, the I mean. One way we'll see, I mean, toward the leadership in the GCC, still the, the sustainability is not there. There's two main, two main leadership just uh, were succeeded last year, and I think as well there are some potentials who might be succeeded. I mean, any any time in, in, uh, in the in the coming midterm maybe. Uh, as well, I think there is no sustainability for the uh, for the large powers uh, influence toward the GCC, where we can see, for example. Trump administration's influence was totally different than what's happening uh, nowadays with, uh, with with Biden, and I think we cannot work just alone because we are really one of the main suppliers as the GCC toward the energy to the to the globe. So, I mean, I mean, internationally that won't be accepted because I mean any uh, any independent I mean interrelation just to, to work uh, aside and apart from either, I mean, other regions' power or uh, apart from uh, any influence from big powers, uh, that will really impact uh, the energy, the energy security globally. So therefore, I cannot see it. It's happening uh, any short to term. Thank you. Would either of you would like to give a timeline to the Iran, uh, Pakistan, India pipeline? I think it's a difficult question, but yeah. Um, if I may quickly, um, I think uh, it's not possible, and I will echo uh, you know Dr. Al Balushi's sentiment regarding the GCC because you know the pipeline uh, you know was you know the profitability of you know, the gas supply through the pipeline originally was contingent on, you know, cooperation between, in addition to cooperation between Iran and Pakistan, it was contingent on cooperation between Pakistan and India. And unfortunately, you know, since the, uh, uh, the BJP government uh, took over in India, uh, you know, our Eastern border uh, has uh, consistently been a flashpoint, you know, uh, and, uh, in the, uh, you know, I think last year, you know, the tensions really, you know, uh, had reached the boil, uh, boiling point. Um, so um, it, uh, you know, so that's sort of one uh, big span in the world works. The other side, other part, as far as, you know, Pakistan and Iran are concerned, is the issue of U.S. sanctions, you know, as uh, Dr. Mohsen also pointed out. Uh, that you know there is uh, you know the looming threat of U.S. sanctions uh, you know because of you know, the policy initiated by uh, Donald Trump. So it will depend on how sort of the new U.S. administration. Partly it will depend on how the new U.S. new U.S. administration proceeds. You know, vis-a-vis uh, uh, Iran. You know, to enable Pakistan. And lastly, there is also regarding uh, the Iran-Pakistan problem. There is also a financial aspect to it because the the the, the, the gas tariff. Uh, yeah, in this change of scenario also has to uh, be reworked between the two uh, countries, you know, uh, you know, so that sort of that uh, there are some, you know, minor issues there as well, you know, uh, where it's, it's an ongoing negotiation, but there are some minor issues uh, where consensus is to be created uh, there as well. Uh, given the overall sort of development trajectory of Pakistan-Iran relations, uh, you know, I am hopeful, you know, but uh, we are uh, still a long way from, you know, sort of this uh, becoming uh, operation. Okay, uh, I think, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we might not be able to take any more questions. I'm going to take this opportunity to thank our three speakers for joining us today and really, you know, enlightening us about uh, these dynamics and, and sort of really pointing out, you know, in summary, I'd say that, that in addition to the broader geopolitical context, what is important to also consider is the, is the regional and perhaps even the local context in the success of these sports. 
Um, so thank you to, to each of the, the three speakers. Thank you to my uh, co-coordinator, Dr. Amit Ranjan, and thank you so much to the staff, both in MEI and, uh, and ISAS for uh, working behind the scenes and making this possible. And thank you, of course, everyone for joining us and listening to us today. Um, have a good day and a good evening, depending on where you are. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Hello. Thanks. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.